Well, good morning, everybody. It's good to have you here this morning. Uh, please go ahead and open up to the Gospel of John. We'll be in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. This morning we're going to be looking at the difference between bona fide faith and fake faith. And we're going to see that on bold display here in John chapter 12 as we see how Mary chooses to worship the Lord and and then how Judas exposes uh, the truth behind his heart. But as we enter into John chapter 12, we're going to step into the final week of Jesus' public ministry. It's called the Passion Week. Of Jesus or the the Holy Week. Um, But before we begin John chapter 12, I want to pause for a moment and I want to address an obvious issue regarding the resurrection of Lazarus from the dead. Um, Here back in John chapter 11. Why is this amazing miracle only recorded in the Gospel of John? Why wouldn't Matthew and or Mark or Luke mentions something that is this uh, amazing. These three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they're known as the synoptic uh, Gospel accounts because they each follow the same basic pattern. They both share, a, all three share a similar story, uh, a summary, just from different perspectives. Um, it's a rather important and essential issue, I think, though. Um, why is it not mentioned? Personally, I've never taken a whole lot of time to investigate it, but I had a really cool conversation a few days ago with um, TJ while we were working on our house, and he brought it up, and I had some thoughts that I had heard in the past, but I never really investigated it very much. But I, I did investigate it a bit, and I think the answer, or the potential answer, is uh, fairly revealing, and it's also uh, beneficial for us to have an understanding as we move forward into the Passion Week of Christ. Um, Many scholars, Bible scholars, uh, propose this idea of an anonymous theory to explain why Lazarus isn't mentioned in the other three Gospels. We know historically that Matthew's Gospel was written first. It was probably written within the first eight to ten years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. Then Mark wrote his account that he got from uh, the Apostle Peter, and then Luke used Um, Matthew and Mark's accounts as uh, basis and research for his extensive uh, study that he did as one of the best historians we've ever had in world history when he sat down and wrote his account. Now, we know for certain that Matthew, Mark, and Luke were written before 70 AD. We know this because they don't take the time to mention the fulfillment of of the destruction of Jerusalem that Jesus prophesies clearly about that's going to take place. There is no mention of it. And we know for certain it was written uh, before that time. Also, at the time, Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote their accounts. The cast of characters uh, that make up the gospel story, uh, many were still alive. When the Apostle Paul wrote his letter to the um, church in Corinth, his first one, He wrote it in uh, 53 to 55 AD, they say. Um, And there he said the following regarding the eyewitnesses of the gospel account. He writes about it in 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 8, and he said, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that He was buried, that He was raised on the third day in accordance with, with the scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, that's Peter, then to the twelve. Verse 6, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some, he said, have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me. So the truth is, that many of the eyewitness followers of Jesus were still alive 
when Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote their account, it is entirely possible, we don't know, but it's entirely possible, that these men felt it necessary to protect some of the identities of these people. While Lazarus was still alive, we're going to find out today that his mere presence is a painful reminder of the truth that Jesus is Messiah. And so the Pharisees, they're going to put a death warrant out for Lazarus. It is entirely possible that Matthew, Mark, and Luke set, uh, left Lazarus' story out to protect their friend. It's also widely accepted that John wrote his gospel last. And in that he wrote it last, um, some scholars still believe John even penned his gospel before 70 AD because he speaks of certain elements in Jerusalem as still standing, even though we know historically it was leveled to the ground by the Romans. However, since John writes his gospel account last, it's entirely possible that the need to protect Lazarus was no longer needed since his body had died yet again and Lazarus was safe in heaven. There's no more need to remain anonymous. We also see this possibility is uh, further substantiated because Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they don't include the actual names of all sorts of gospel uh, characters, core ones. While John, when you read John's gospel, he's dropping names all over the place. Again, the reason is probably because at this point, those people had passed away. The need to protect their identities had expired. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they never mentioned, if you read their account, that Peter is the one in the Garden of Gethsemane who lops off the high priest's servant's ear. You just know that it's one of the disciples. That's all it said. But by the time you get to John's Gospel, he says, no, that's Peter, right? He <laughs> reveals what's going on. And then the synoptic writers also, they don't tell you that it was Mary, who we're going to look at today, who anoints Jesus' feet with oil and worship. But John identifies her. We also see the reverse is true um, in the sense that John takes no time to mention um, the resurrection of Jairus' daughter from the dead. But Matthew, Mark, and Luke do, right? So just because it's not mentioned there is not a reason for us to panic or think that somehow it's, it's additional or something that, that didn't actually happen. Finally, it's also obvious that as John wrote his gospel account last... He uses it to fill in gaps. He uses his gospel account to fill in gaps that Matthew, Mark, and Luke had left out. That cho They chose not to highlight it. In fact, John is super clear about why he included some of the specific stories in his gospel, in this book, when he wrote in John chapter 21, verse 25. He said, now, there are many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written? I suppose the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. Okay, so it's obvious to say that just because we have what Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John have written down, it's in no way uh, encapsulates all that Jesus did. It's just what was chosen to be highlighted. And in John's gospel, he's trying to fill in gaps. Now, with that being said, we're going to start into John chapter 12 and we're going to enter into um, the Passion Week of Christ. It's the last uh, six days, last week of, of the life of Christ. Now, I have a chart in my study Bible. It's, like, it's a really kicking chart. So I decided to show it to you somewhat today. Hopefully I, I did it justice. But we're going to just walk really quick through the Passion Week, and I want you to watch what happens with John's Gospel compared to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because it's really significant to the rest of what we're going to study as we finish out um, his Gospel. So the Saturday before Jesus um, is crucified, we read here, there's several events that we know in the Passion Week, right? That's the next column. So Jesus is in Bethany. John mentions it. <laughs> Um, Matthew, Mark, and John mention Mary anointing Jesus, and then uh, the crowd wanting to see Jesus. Only John highlights most of what's going on on Saturday. We get to Sunday, 
And there's the triumphal entry. All four gospel writers speak about the triumphal entry. But then we have John speaking about Greeks seeking Jesus. John uh, speaking about Jesus entering the temple, right? Now watch this. Watch what happens on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. The cursing of the fig tree. The clearing of the temple. Return to Bethany. John says nothing. Matthew, Mark, and Luke cover it pretty good. Tuesday. The fig tree withering, the teaching in the temple, the all of that discourse about the teaching of the end times and the destruction of the temple. Um, John says nothing. Wednesday, teaching more in the temple, the plot to kill Jesus, uh, prepping for the Passover. John says nothing. Thursday, the Passover meal. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, man, they, they give it some time. John says nothing. You get to the upper room discourse, this conversation that takes place immediately following the Passover meal, and John just goes off. It's basically 20% of his gospel account that we're holding in our hands. 20% of the book, basically, is this upper room discourse that John makes sure that he wants you to understand. Then, Jesus praying in the garden. John skips it. But man, you get to the essential, the core thing, right? What do we believe about the gospel? It is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus. Man, all four gospel accounts, man, they're all over it, right? So it's essential. Now, with that being said, before we jump here into verse 1, I want you to think about one other thing. The Passion Week is the last week of the life of Christ. I want you to think for just a moment about how quickly a week unfolds in your own life. Think how quick it's been since last Sunday. In in that period of time, Jesus is going to have this encounter where Mary anoints his feet in preparation for what's about to happen. He's going to write in. We'll speak about it next week on Palm Sunday. It's just, it's really cool. I didn't plan for it to be that way, but next week we're going to speak about Palm Sunday on Palm Sunday, his triumphal entry. But from that moment, in those short, that short week's worth of time, you've got Jesus riding in on the donkey. Everybody's like, hey, Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Same crowd of people, five days later, less than five days later, are screaming at the top of their lungs, crucify him. He'll be crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected all within a week. It's it's intense. Okay? Now, As we go in here to John chapter 12, verse 1, I want you to begin to think about, we're going to look at the difference between bona fide faith and fake faith. And we're going to see it on grand display. Uh, Chapter uh, 12, verse 1. Let me pray. Father, what an amazing privilege that we have. Lord, to just sit here today, to be here today, and to open up your word. Father, it's our prayer. It's my prayer as well. Lord, would you please open your word, Lord, today to our hearts and open our hearts to your word. Come, Holy Spirit, speak plainly to us. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. All right, John 12, verse 1. We enter into the Passion Week. Six days before the Passover. Jesus therefore came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. First of all, we know that Jesus was crucified Friday afternoon. Six days before Friday places this event. Saturday, that's not hard. Okay. Six days before Friday, 
That's Saturday. Okay. Jesus comes into Bethany and he's uh, apparently he's looking forward to enjoying one more time with his friends, Martha, Mary and Lazarus. It's a Sabbath after a couple days. Imagine Lazarus. It's only been a few days since his spirit has been back inside his body. Hopefully, maybe he's feeling a little more at home back in his hide again. Uh, But from the accounts uh, of this event that we get here in a moment from Matthew and Mark, we learn that this meal took place in the home of a man who is known as Simon the leper, not because he was probably still a leper, but he was probably somebody that Jesus had healed of his leprosy, just like Jesus had healed the man born blind. Now, why bring up this idea? Why do Matthew and Mark chose, uh, choose to highlight this idea of him being this event happening in the house of Simon the leper? I think it's interesting from a comparison standpoint. We're going to be comparing the bona fide faith of Mary and the fake faith of Judas. Listen, it's interesting. Mary is going to perform this act of genuine worship in the house of Simon. We know from Scripture in John chapter 13, verse 2, guess what Judas' dad's name is? It's Simon. He's of the house of Simon. Now, it's not the same Simon, right? It's not Simon the leper. But here we're going to see true worship displayed by Mary in the house of Simon. And then we're going to have fake faith on display from the house of Simon. It's just interesting. Verses 2 through 3. So they gave Jesus a dinner there. And Martha served. Good old Martha. She's always doing that. Thank God for servants. And Lazarus was one of those reclining with Jesus at the table. Mary therefore took a pound of expensive ointment made of pure nard and anointed the feet of Jesus and she wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. In these two verses, we see the beauty, first of all, of these siblings and their interaction with Jesus. Lazarus is enjoying reclining at the table with his friend who just raised him from the dead. Martha is enjoying using her gift of service to bless other people. And we encounter Mary again. She found her way to Jesus' feet again. Only this time, it wasn't um, to just listen to his teaching. It wasn't for her to express her confusion and grief over the death of her brother. This time, she's there um, to worship. And her worship is so extravagant that we still marvel at it 2,000 years later. From Matthew and Mark, we learn that Mary uh, contained this perfume in an alabaster jar. Um, It was most likely a perfume vase that she had. Hers contained one pound of pure nard, and it's a sweet-smelling, rare, and fragrant perfume found in the remote regions of India. Many scholars assume that Mary had been saving up this Perfume as an investment for her own dowry. For the man that she would love as her husband someday. But instead, what's Mary do with it? She pours it out on another man that she loves. Her Savior, her Lord. When she comes, she breaks it. She spills out the contents on her Lord. Mary valued her relationship with Christ more than any monetary possession. Money was no object to her. She viewed the value of the perfume as nothing when compared to the Lord. What do you suppose, I mean, we know the story, we just got done reading it. What do you suppose was the motivating force behind this extravagant act of worship? Yeah. The Lord that she loved just resurrected her brother from the dead. And she wanted to say, thank you. I worship you. I think it's interesting if you know much of the gospel accounts, right? How often does Jesus get served like this? 
Well, you don't really find any, if you're honest. This is pretty much about the only one. And in this case, Jesus receives it, and he accepts this very personal, intimate act of love and worship from her. Uh, Mary's worship reminded me of a scene from a parable that Jesus spoke in Matthew 25. Um, We taught through this uh, parable just this week at Campus Life on Monday. The scene in the parable is the final judgment seat when Christ comes again. And all of humanity is gathered before the throne, the Bible says, of Jesus, where Jesus is going to gather all of humanity and he's going to separate them as a shepherd separates what? Sheep from goats, right? Jesus will tell the sheep to enter into the kingdom of God because when Jesus was sick, they visited him. When he was hungry, they fed him. When they were thirsty, when he was thirsty, they gave him something to drink, etc. And then the sheep are not even going to be able to remember doing any of that for Jesus. And then Jesus will tell them, Matthew 25, 40. I forgot who I gave that to, but somebody has it. Is it it Caleb? And the king will say, I tell you the truth, when you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you were doing it for me. When you did it to the least of these, my brothers, and when you've gone out and you've served and cared for other people and met their physical needs in that moment in the name of Christ, Jesus says something really radical. He says when you're doing that, you're not just doing that for that person. He literally says you did it to who? Me. Well, in Mary's case, you don't even have to have a metaphor. It's Jesus. She pours out this perfume on his feet. Imagine how the aroma completely saturated the entire room. I don't know about you. Um, I'm not one much for perfume too much because, man, it just sometimes it overwhelms my senses. And I'm just like, wow, that's a lot. Especially if somebody irrigates it, right? When they put it on. I'm not one for going into the department store and walking through the perfume department. It's like, oh. But in this particular case, I mean, if you can picture, you know, being around somebody that's had a lot of perfume on, you're like, wow, that's a lot of perfume. Imagine a woman coming into the room, taking this super, um, the aroma, just super powerful, and she just pours it out just bathes Jesus' feet in perfume, one pound of it, 16 ounces. When you go get your little perfume spray, is that one pound worth? Anybody ever buy it? Right? It's like an ounce or a half an ounce, right? And that'll last you however long, you know, spritz here, spritz there. No. 16 ounces of this stuff. Right? John says that the house is totally saturated with the fragrance, right? Which certainly it was. Jesus' feet would have been wet with it. They were wet with it. Mary's hair marinated in this perfume. Her genuine worship of Jesus offered up this fragrant aroma for everyone around her. I want to offer up to you this morning to think about that when we take the time, you and me, to sit at Jesus' feet and genuinely worship Him, Our lives are saturated with the aroma of His presence. And He enjoys it. We see here, when Mary does this act, that she displays bona fide faith. Now, this word bona fide is interesting. I looked, I looked it up. It's like, well, you know, I know it like means genuine or whatever, right? But I was like, I don't know. I looked up what it, what it means, this Latin phrase. It means good faith. Mary is going to display good faith in Jesus. That's exactly what transpires. Now, bona fide faith. We see here in Mary's example that it's motivated by true love. By true love. Listen, this is really important. You're going to, if you don't get this, 
your, your Christian life is, and trying to live out your faith in Jesus Christ is all, it's going to be super jacked up. So please pay attention. Faith, genuine faith in the Lord is motivated by true love of the Lord. Genuine faith sees the love that God has displayed for you. The extravagance that God would come and pay the price for my sin in full so that I could be forgiven and redeemed and restored and given everlasting life. And, 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 and. And I get it for free. That ought to organically produce in me and you a desire to love Him in return. Now, if that's in place, then bona fide faith loves to sacrifice. It's not a burden. It was not a burden for Mary to come with her jar that she'd been saving up and just pour it out all over the Lord because she loved him. I do things for Danielle that I wouldn't do just for anybody because I love her as my wife. And when she asks me to do something, I'm more willing to be, you know, I love her. So yes, I'll do what you need. And it's not a burden because I love her. And the Lord is asking us to follow Him in that sort of relationship. It's supposed to be a loving relationship. And love is willing to sacrifice. Why did Jesus die for you? What was His motivation? To sacrifice Himself, right? It was love. It was driving the boat the whole time. Also, bona fide faith is personal, but it's not private. This whole idea of like, well, you know, I've got this really personal but faith, but it's very private to me. Well, I'm sorry, but that's not scriptural. I mean, I I care about you, but that's that's actually inaccurate. You don't find that in the Bible. Now, it can be private. It is private. We engage with the Lord in private, but it's not to remain private. God did not um, save you so you could be, you know, 007 for Jesus. (laughs) Right, that he doesn't need any secret agents. It is personal. It's deeply personal. This act of worship of Mary of the Lord is deeply personal. But is she exposed? Woo, man! She exposes herself to. We'll see it here in just a second. Open ridicule. But she's like, man, I am going to worship him. I don't care. I don't care what people say. And finally, bona fide faith expresses heartfelt worship of the Lord. It's not fake. It's not phony. It's not a performance. It's genuine. This morning, I just want to um, sing Broken and Spilled Out to you really quick. I would invite you um, to maybe, while you listen, just close your eyes think about what we've read let's just sit in awe a little bit and think about what the Lord has done for us and what Mary did for the Lord this day one day a plane village woman driven by love for her Lord recklessly poured out a valuable essence disregarding the score And once it was broken and spilled out, a fragrance filled all the room. 
Like a prisoner released from his shackles, like a spirit set free from the tomb, broken and spilled out, just for love of you, Jesus. My most precious treasure, lavished on Thee, broken and spilled out, and poured at Your feet in sweet abandon, let me be spilled out and used up for Thee. God's precious treasure, His loved and His own perfect Son, sent here to show me the love of the Father. Just for love it was done. And though you were perfect and holy, you gave up yourself willingly. You spared no expense for my pardon. You were used up and wasted for me, broken and spilled out, just for love of me, Jesus. God's most precious treasure lavished on me broken and spilled out and poured out my feet in sweet abandon, Lord, you were spilled out and used up for me. In sweet abandon, let me be spilled out and used up for Thee. So Mary's in this moment, she's fully exposed, vulnerable, offered up this extravagant worship, bona fide faith, enter Judas. But Judas Iscariot, 
One of Jesus' disciples, he who was about to betray Jesus, said, Why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Now, here we find another contrast between Mary and Judas. Mary born or offers up this sacrifice in the house of Simon, Judas of the house of Simon. Mary takes her box or jar of expensive perfume and she just pours it out in worship. Judas wants to hoard the money in the treasury box so he could steal some later. Now, Judas tried to put a righteous face on his wicked, selfish intentions. He doesn't care about the poor. He cares about himself. He couldn't bear to watch the waste of the perfume, even if it was being poured out on the feet of the Messiah. It was worth, Judas says, nearly a year's worth of wages. 300 denarii. That's a denarii or denarius is a day's wage. Now, if you work... For just over minimum wage, that's $15 an hour, you're going to earn in a year $30,000. Okay, so imagine in Judas's mind, Mary just wasted $30,000. Just poured it out on the ground. Obviously, Judas didn't value Jesus above money. Sure, Jesus was great, but money was greater. What he really wanted was the benefit of being able to skim some of the money from the sale of the perfume out of the money box for himself. Here we discover Judas' downfall and the motivation behind his betrayal of Christ. Now, there's a lot of debate about what motivated Judas to betray Jesus. Some people speculate that he attempted to force Jesus' hand to defend himself and then reveal himself in power as the conquering hero that the Jews expected. But when the plan failed miserably, then Judas grieved over what he'd done. Personally, I'm just offering up my opinion. I think that Scripture is very clear about the motivation and the inspiration behind why Judas did what he did. What does John say it is? Greed. We don't have to read between the lines. We don't have to imagine a scenario. Financial greed motivated Judas to betray Jesus. Judas was a thief. A fact, I assume, that the disciples discovered after his death. Right? If they'd have known it in the moment, it would have been addressed. Money was Judas's God, not Jesus. Money was the answer to his problems, not the Messiah. In all likelihood... Um, He followed Jesus for three years, hoping for a financial payoff in the end when Jesus assumed the throne as King of Israel, as the Messiah. Judas is thinking like, if I can ride those coattails, then I could be well off. When that dream is clearly destroyed this fateful Saturday night, Saturday evening with Mary, Mark tells us that Judas went immediately to the Pharisees who are looking to what with Jesus? Kill him. To betray Jesus for what? What does he betray Jesus for? Money. It's not rocket science. Mark 14, 10 through 11. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12, this is Mark's account, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. And when they heard it, they were glad. They promised to give him money. And he sought an opportunity to betray Jesus. Listen, Jesus, or Judas is not an example in the Bible of a believer gone astray. He is a fake follower of Jesus all along. Matthew, how do we know Judas is a fake follower? Well, there's lots of reasons. But here, Matthew 6, 24, we're just going to put the cherry on top. Jesus here is um, delivering the Sermon on the Mount, and he says this, No one can serve two masters. 
right? How many people does that include? Well, everybody, right? Me, you, everybody. I, nobody can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. Then Jesus says, you cannot serve both God and what? Money. In the end, Judas loved money. Therefore, he did what with Jesus? Hated him. You love the one and hate the other. He loved money. He ended up hating Jesus. And finally, Judas could not fake his faith anymore. In this last six week or six days of Jesus' life, Judas, he can't fake it anymore. He's reached his boiling point. Now, fake faith. It loves to hide behind masks, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be a good what? It wouldn't be a good fake, right? It loves to hide behind masks. And Judas here has been hiding for quite some time. I, d- I doubt, well, we know for certain, according to Jesus, he didn't hide it from Jesus. Jesus Uh, Scripture said that one of the messianic prophecies that the Messiah was going to have to fulfill is that he's going to be betrayed by one of his closest friends. So Jesus tolerates this nonsense for three years and continues to love on and care for Judas extravagantly, which we'll see here as we go through the Gospel of John. But as a fake, fake faith loves to lie and deceive. Loves to lie and deceive. When you think about Judas, sometimes, you know, it's really easy to be like, oh, Judas, how what a terrible human being. Listen, uh, churches today are full of Judas. There's plenty of Judas running around. And it's not just sitting in the background. Judas is one of the 12. If you were to put Judas in today's Uh, terminology, Judas would be a pastor. Judas would be a deacon, an elder, a Sunday school teacher, the church administrator. He was there all the time, every event, everything, listening to it all, engaging in it all. But inside, behind closed doors, All the nice fake. But you know what? Fake faith can't fake it forever. This is true of everybody. The the Bible says, be sure your what will find you out. Yeah, be sure your sin will find you out. At some point, we, we can't keep faking it. And we see this take place in Judas's life. He's been going along. Did you know this is interesting? (laughs) When Judas says, Hey, why wasn't this ointment sold for 300 uh, denarii and given to the poor? Did you know that's the first time that Judas's words are recorded in all the Gospels? That's the first thing he's ever recorded as saying. That's on purpose. Fake faith eventually betrays Jesus. Just is what it is. He displayed when he spoke. He displayed Jesus' previous previous statement when he was speaking to the Pharisees. It's interesting, as soon as Judas decides to betray Jesus, he goes where? To what camp? Oh, to the Pharisees. Listen to what Jesus says about the Pharisees in Matthew uh, 12, 34. Jesus tells the Pharisees, You brood of vipers, how... Uh, How can you speak good when you're evil? And then Jesus says this profound statement, for out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Judas sees this go on, and he's like, what in the world? We could have bought a new car. You just poured it out on the ground? You idiot woman. Stupid woman. What are you doing? What about me? I could have taken a 10% off the top. It's 
crazy. Seven through eight. Listen to Jesus. This is cool. I love when Jesus has, when he flexes a little bit on people. And he does that right here with Judas. <clears throat> John 12, seven through eight. Jesus said, leave her alone. Leave her alone, Judas. So that she may keep it for the day of my burial. The poor you always have with you, you don't always have me. Jesus here in his amazing foreknowledge, he says that she had kept it in advance for the day of his burial. Now Mary wasn't keeping this uh, ointment reserved for the burial of Jesus. She was keeping it for some other purpose. But like we've been talking about, right? God's ways aren't our ways. His thoughts aren't our thoughts. In that whole process, she's storing that up thinking, oh, you know, maybe someday for my dowry. And the Lord's like, no, Mary, I've got a better idea, right? And here comes Jesus and she's pouring it out on him in advance for his burial. And Christ defends her and it reminds me, again, in John chapter 10, Jesus calls himself the good what? Shepherd, okay? It reminds me of the good shepherd in the book of um, Psalms when we read the, the shepherd psalm in Psalm 23. And in that... Uh, Psalm, it says in verse 5 about the good shepherd. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. And the good shepherd here, Mary's in this moment. She's in the presence of an unknown enemy. She doesn't know at the time Judas is a phony. And Jesus defends her he protects her he protects his sheep who does he protect her from a wolf and sheep's oh i'll be darned fake faith even with all the also jesus begins to speak about the poor you're always going to what okay apparently in spite of all the social justice campaigns in the world (laughs) and the economic strategies to try to eradicate poverty which i'm not Poo-pooing. I mean, we need to have a heart for the poor. It, it is a God-given, God-ordained thing. But to sit around and be dumb enough to think and arrogant enough to think that we're going to be able to eradicate poverty is nonsense. Jesus himself said, the poor you're always going to have, but you won't always have me. He's literally just days before he's going to be crucified, buried, I don't think, uh, (laughs) it's no wonder that the the Lord enjoyed hanging out with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, this set of siblings. This home in Bethany is one of the places where he would often stay. Man, he rarely received the love, attention, and adoration he deserved. It must have been a special moment for him. One of his followers stepped out in faith and adored him publicly. And as a result, Jesus pauses and says something we know in Mark about this account. I think I asked Kevin to read it. This is what Jesus said about this act from Mary. And truly, I say to you, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in memory of her. How cool is that? And here we sit, Jesus makes that prophecy, and 2,000 years later, what are we talking about? What did John make sure he had written down in his account too? As we spend time together here, we see the fulfillment of this prophecy by Jesus. Man, we speak of what's happened, what genuine worship by Mary looks like, and how it exposes the fake faith of Judas. Now, verses 9 through 11. When the large crowd of Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came, not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he'd raised from the dead. Man, 
people have just, they've, they're flooding Jerusalem in preparation for the Passover. They hear about this miracle that has occurred just two miles out of town. They're like, hot diggity dog, let's go get over there. That doesn't take very long. And they walk over there and they're not just there to see Jesus, but who's also an attraction now? Lazarus, right? Like, let's go see a guy that was four days dead and he's breathing and walking around. This is wild. Could this be true? So, the chief priests, good old Caiaphas again, we talked about him last week, made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away and believing in Jesus. I don't know, sometimes when I read the Bible, I mean, there are, there's a lot that's in the Bible that should be shocking to us. And I think when you read... Uh, about the chief priests and their murderous intentions, it should be shocking. Lazarus' resurrection is indisputable. And as a result, many of the Jews are believing in Jesus. The Bible says this. It's interesting as we close. The Bible says this about, we know that Caiaphas, the high priest, was a Sadducee. There, are, there is a difference, significant difference, between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And this is one of the primary reasons why they hated each other so much, even though they were against Jesus. The Pharisees believed in the resurrection from the dead. Caiaphas is a Sadducee. The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. Lazarus poses a significant problem for Caiaphas as a Sadducee because he has been resurrected from the dead and it's indisputable. Therefore, let's kill him again. Let's murder him. He must be destroyed. All of this sets the stage for Jesus, we'll speak about it next week on Palm Sunday, about his triumphal entry. Jesus, as he rides into Jerusalem on this donkey and this crazy wild scene, crowd of people celebrating his entrance into Jerusalem, in the background, what's going on in the background with the Pharisees and the chief priests? Oh, they're looking for their opportunity. They've already got it hatched. With Judas, they're just waiting for the appropriate moment when they can pull it off. And Jesus rides into town knowing it 100%. And he goes anyway. Why? For you. For me. And he valued saving you and me and the millions, billions of other people who have placed their faith in Jesus over the ages on the face of the earth. He valued us over Himself. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. In this is love, not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. As we close just want to ask you to ponder for a second and close your eyes. Sometimes it helps you to focus. This is a personal question for you to reflect on. What kind of faith do you have? Is it bona fide or fake? Do you enjoy hiding behind a mask to fool other people? You can only fool people, including yourself, for so long. Eventually, your true motives will rise to the surface, whether you like it or not. My encouragement is, stop deceiving yourself. Instead, like Mary, may we simply fall in love with the Lord. May we offer up ourselves as living sacrifices. May our personal faith shine brightly in public as we openly express our heartfelt worship for Jesus. Without fear. Father, 
this morning. That, that is my prayer. Lord, that we would all, all of us, have genuine faith in you. And Lord, if we, in honesty, as we sit here, Lord, realize, you know what, it is right now fake and I don't want it to be. I want to believe. I want it to be genuine, bona fide. Then Lord, I just pray that you'd give, give us the courage to reach out and ask and say, what's, what's the story? How can I surrender to Jesus? So that we might come to genuine faith, bona fide faith in you. And Father, for those of us here today with bona fide faith, oh God, would you just give us the courage to worship you openly, without fear. Lord, may we take what you've done for us personally and speak of it openly in public so that others might come to know you too, Jesus. And along the way, Lord, when we're ridiculed for it, like Judas ridiculed Mary, Lord, you'll protect us. You'll guard us. You'll be the good shepherd. And Lord, as we enter into this season of remembrance, of your sacrifice for us, I just pray, God, that we would marinate in it, that we would just marinate in your word, in the Passion Week that leads up to your sacrifice. God, that we'd marinate in the story of your death, your burial, and your resurrection. And that we would sit in awe of it, Lord, that it would not grow so familiar to us, Lord, that we skip over it and go, there we had Easter, there we celebrated the resurrection. And let me move on. But Lord, instead, that we just be blown away by the reality of what you've done. Lord, just like Mary, blown away by the blessing of resurrecting her brother from the dead. Lord, wait, may we be blown away by what you've done for us, Lord, in that you have resurrected us from the dead. We were dead in our trespasses and sin, but by grace, <laughs> through faith, you have redeemed us. And we're alive forevermore. It's in your name that we pray, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for being here today. You're dismissed. Oh, good. 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 Blessing. Yeah. Love you, Jason.